And thank you, Christine. I will begin with a confession. Christian theology gives me a headache. <laughs> <laughs> what I love to study is language. How a great writer makes his thought and argument clear, convincing, beautiful. And Paul is a great writer as well as a great theologian. Greek may have been his second language, but he had mastered it. Even in this early letter, he gives us a moving and profound understanding of the Christian faith. At the end of the letter, we hear, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This reminds us that Paul dictated the letter to a scribe, so he's conscious of what his words sound like. And this is what I think is very important for us to remember and why I'm going to read a lot. In the ancient world, few people knew how to read, and anyone who did read read out loud. So when the letter came to Corinth, someone in the congregation who could read would read it out loud. So Paul is speaking to their ears, not their eyes. That's why, as I say, we have... Uh, this all these handouts. Um, this first epistle of the Corinthians is one of the earliest documents in the New Testament. It was written in 54, well before the earliest gospel, Mark, which is dated somewhere around 70. Paul had spent a year or more at Corinth as an apostle and then as a pastor, 51 to 52. Now he is in Ephesus on the coast of Turkey, and he's heard disturbing things about that Christian congregation. So he writes in this long letter. Now there are two passages in the letter which concern the Lord's Supper. Chapter 10, 14 to 22, and 11, 17 to 34. This is what you have on the handout. You have both the NRSV translation which came out in 1989, and a more recent translation. And it comes from this massive commentary that I consulted, written by uh, Thistleton. His book came out in 2000, as well as commenting on every passage. He also has his own translation. And one of the things I think is important is to realize that any translation is an interpretation. If you can't read the Greek, which you all should, of course, <laughs> um, I think it's good to hear different translations. We can get, um, so NRSV almost passes by that we don't hear it, as well as when you suddenly hear the familiar words in a different version, then, then you, you hear them. Uh, in the first passage, which we'll study, the Lord's Supper is actually an example Paul is using to clarify sharing, but the Lord's Supper is the main topic in the longer passage, which contains the earliest account of the institution of the Lord's Supper. The background for the problem Paul confronts in chapter 10 is that, of course, sacrifices to Greek or Roman deities involved a meal, often with meat, aha, celebrated by a gathering of worshipers. As we learn from the earlier chapters of this letter, some Corinthians felt that, as saved Christians, they could do whatever they liked about matters of eating and drinking. Paul must get them to realize that the Christian meal is different and how it is different. In the verse just preceding our passage, Paul writes, God is faithful and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. Here then, verses 14 to 15. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from the worship of idols. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. So then, my very dear friends, this is Thistleton, flee from idolatry. I appeal to your common sense. Judge for yourselves what I declare. God is faithful. The Corinthians should not be faithless by participating in those pagan sacrifices in idolatry. Note that Paul addresses them, however, as dear or very dear friends. 
with the Greek adjective, which is derived from agape, the Greek word for Christian love. He also appeals to their good sense. His love for them motivates his command, flee from idolatry, and his specific theological declaration, you cannot, you cannot, verse 21. Their good sense should enable them to understand and be convinced by his argument. We now turn to verse 16. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Or the cup of blessing over which we offer a blessing, is it not a communal participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a communal participation in the body of Christ? The we here is an assertion of community, which I think is better emphasized by Thistleton's communal participation. So what does Paul mean by sharing in the blood and body of Christ? He means identification with Christ in his death as both the source of redemption and the pattern for life, that is, suffering for others. You may notice that here Paul names the cup first, seemingly out of order. The cup of blessing recalls the third cup of the Seder meal at the Passover, and the context of that meal helps us to understand Paul's text here. The recital of God's redemptive acts at the Seder used the first person. It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came forth out of Egypt. Paul needs to bring the Corinthians to that personal sharing in the crucifixion of Christ. When we share the broken bread, we share in the sacrificial death of Christ. Paul wants us to feel this connection. Luther asserted that this verse 16 denotes, quote, a share in everything that my body, Christ's body, has and does and suffers. That is, if I died with Christ, I cannot share in idolatry. When Justin, an early Christian apologist, describes a Christian Lord's Supper, he adds, if some are absent, it is permitted to carry to them a share. We do this each Sunday with the words adapted from verse 17, because there is one bread, we who are many, on one body, we all partake of the one bread. Or because there is one bread, many as we are, we are one body. I think that's important. We are so individualistic in the United States. Many as we are, we are one body, for it's the one bread that we all share. This verse is, of course, very important in Paul's argument. One body stands in contrast to these splits and divisions which characterize the Christian community at Corinth. Paul uses Christ's body given over on the cross to refocus and enlarge the application of this metaphor, body, to the church. Verse 18 takes us back to Jewish sacrificial practice. Consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifices partners in the altar or consider Israel of earthly descent, are they, are not those who eat the sacrifices communal participants? That's what I like, um, in the altar of sacrifice. Eating what has been sacrificed to a deity cannot be equated with an ordinary meal. Yet Paul must also be quick to deny that there's any real power or reality to those sacrifices and the gods to whom they were offered. So we go on. What do I imply there? That food sacrificed to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. Now here, Thistleton's translation is helpful. What then do I mean to affirm? The, that the offering of what is sacrificed to idols amounts to anything? 
or that an idol is anything, not that, but that when they sacrifice, in quotation marks, they offer sacrifices to demons and not to God. This is because here, and you may have seen this, heard this, Paul is specifically evoking the golden calf incident when the Israelites set up an idol for sacrifice because he echoes here what Moses sang after that incident. They sacrifice to demons, not God. This is in Deuteronomy. So you see, and I think this is important, Paul is a Jew, remember? For Paul, Moses speaks to these Corinthians just as he did to the Israelites. Mm -hmm. they're, they're joined. Now, this is a textual note, which I probably shouldn't bother you with, but mm -hmm. I think it's important for translation. Some early Christians misunderstood Paul and added pagans, and you have it in the NRSV translation, before the first verb sacrifice. But Paul means that anyone who sacrifices to an idol. So modern translations, not only Thistleton, which you have, but David Bentley Hart, preserve Paul's generalization. What they sacrifice, any of you all, they sacrifice to demons. Christians must not participate in those sacrifices, though they are empty. Verse 20 to 21. I do not want you to be partners with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or, but I do not want you to become communal participants in demonic forces. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of devilish powers. You cannot participate in the table of the Lord and the table of demons. That's a good example of translation. I feel partake is a church word which you never hear in modern English. And so participate in the table makes it clearer what he means. Now, this business of demons and demonic powers, that requires careful interpretation. That the demonic is real and powerful, Paul will never deny. Demons represent active evil powers hostile to God. On the other hand, they're also nothings in and of themselves. What Paul needs to do is to prevent his Corinthian parishioners from entering into the pagan thought world where those beings were real. The emphatic cannot, verse 21, has, has a lot of work. In a way, it's a logical cannot. You can't do both of these and be valid logic. But it's also, I think, important in terms of Christian institution, if we will. You can't be Christian and do this and still be counted as Christians if you're participating in sacrifices to pagan deities. Paul Philip designated as the demonic anything that fragments the one loyalty and the ultimate concern that belongs to God alone. And I think it's precisely this fragmentation that has been happening at Corinth that Paul has to deal with. Our last verse, or are we provoking the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? What? Are we in process of arousing the Lord to jealousy? Surely it cannot be that we are stronger than he, can it? So this, you see, is the jealous God of the golden calf incident. The last clause sounds solemn in a way, but it may be ironical as well. That word stronger takes us back to those strong Corinthians who felt that they could participate in pagan practices and remain unscathed. Sharing this communal participation means a covenant relationship. And covenant is very important, as Paul writes in First Corinthians, giving it a particular center on Christ. Well, it's not surprising that verses 14 to 22 or chapter 10 are never read as part of the common lectionary. <laughs> we are not tempted to eat at the table of demons. So 
A piece in the New York Times last week struck me, though, as I thought about what modern message this passage might have for us. The author said this, when we go to a restaurant today, we may inquire whether the ingredients are local, sourced well, free range, organic. The author suggested we should be asking whether the server, the cook, the dishwashers, all the staff, are they paid a living wage? Do they have health insurance? Do they have a family with you? These are the people that Jesus cared the most about. Perhaps we can do something about those people. <laughs> now we turn to the big passage, 11, 17, and 34. As you can see, this way with that. And if I was gonna say if you've got them kind of if you yeah, it's hard. I'm sorry. But that. if you hold it like this, oh, then you can go back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> the problem that Paul has to address here is how the Corinthians celebrate the Lord's Supper. Earlier, he could write that I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions just as I handed them on to you. But now, in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worst. <laughs> now, in giving these directives, I cannot continue my comments because the meetings you hold as a church, that's the point, <laughs> do more harm than good. Thus, as he tried to bring the Corinthians to an understanding of sharing in chapter 10, so we now hear come together on fun. Most emphatically in 17, 18, 20, and then again at the conclusion of the passage in 33 and 34. Apparently, when the Corinthians came together as one body, they didn't come together as one body, but with divisions. So, verse 18, or to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. First of all, I am given to understand that when you meet together as an assembled church, splits occur among you, and to some extent, I believe it. Earlier in this letter, Paul was concerned with splits, divisions which were external, divisions between different groups of house groups of the church. Here, however, the very individual house meeting itself reflects divisions as we read. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, or only so will it become clear who among you is genuine. Now here again, Thistleton's translation is more helpful. For in quotation marks, dissensions are unavoidable. It is claimed among you in order that those who are tried and true among you may be visibly revealed. This verse is puzzling and has provoked a lot of scholarly debate. I think, as I say, this will be the translation where we put that dissensions are unavoidable. It's a saying there, um, a, perhaps a familiar saying. It may be relevant to the end times when I think there's some kind of prediction in the Bible that there will be divisions before the final <laughs> consummation. Or Paul's words may be ironical. This verse does highlight that the Corinthians not only tolerate divisions, they apparently justify them. What they do is to apply the standards of their highly stratified society to the Christian community. At that time, as you know, there were no church buildings. The um, Lord's Supper would be held at a private house, often, of course, the house of a wealthier person who had a, a bigger space. At Corinth, the house meeting has reflected the divisions between the socially advantaged and the socially disadvantaged. So we hear in verse 20, 
When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. Accordingly, when you meet together in the same place, your meeting does not amount to an eating of the Lord's Supper. In other words, the Lord's Supper has been transformed into a private party, <laughs> a party meal given for the benefit of some inner group invited by the host. And uh, even bad as this sounds, Paul does say, to some extent, I believe it, maybe, maybe not all hosts were quite that bad. So what exactly went on in these bad meetings? For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry, and another becomes drunk. <laughs> you do not have homes to eat and drink in. And do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. And again, this will just sort of underline some things. For at the time of eating, each individual devours his or her own meal. One actually goes hungry. Another is even drunk. Surely it cannot be that you have no homes of your own for your eating and drinking, can it? Or do you show contempt for the church which is God's and put to shame those who have nothing? What am I to say to you? Am I to congratulate you? On this matter, I cannot give my approval. And see here again, I think the same from, or do you show contempt for the church of God, which has become such a familiar phrase that just passes through when he says, or do you show contempt for the church, which is God's? It's not your church, God's church. So he repeats the fact he does not commend them. Now, I learned something fascinating from this commentary. Archaeology helps us to understand verses 21 and 22. A villa recently excavated via Florence is dated to the time of Paul's letter. In that dining room, the Trisinian, where guests were climbed on couches at individual tables, there is space for nine guests. Perhaps 20 or 30 others could be accommodated in the atrium. Obviously, the poorer and less esteemed guests would be there. The food and drink in the dining room would be superior in quality to what was offered to the others. What may have made this even more intense at the time Paul was writing is that we hear in historical record that there was a famine in Greece at this time. And so obviously the poor people would have been even more uh, desperately in need of help and here they're being given nothing. Um, the phrase Lord's Supper, which is a Greek historiacon <coughs> dajon, which you have here in plenty, this is the earliest phrase that was used to describe what we sometimes call the Eucharist or the Holy Communion. But you see that it strongly expresses Paul's point. This is the Lord's Supper, not their Supper. So Paul in this letter often compares himself to being just a simple man, not like those famous Greek speakers, but you can see that he is perfectly able to lose, use all the techniques of Greek rhetoric. For example, here in 22, he uses what are called rhetorical questions to show them what their behavior really means. If you own a house, of course, not many would. You shouldn't make times when you invite guests for a meal at your house. That's not the same thing as when you offer your house as a meeting place for fellow believers to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We will hear verses 23 to 26 on Monday, Thursday. They are the only verses from these two passages in 1 Corinthians, which are in the common collection. 
Paul now repeats the tradition about the Lord's Supper he received from the Lord. This was probably an oral, not a written tradition, but he doesn't tell us any more about it. We'd like to know. At some point, of course, from my perspective, what Jesus said in Aramaic was translated into Greek. Although at this time, the form of institution was not completely fixed, there can be no doubt that these verses are pre-Paul. Paul did not write this. They are, in fact, something he learned from elsewhere. And this is one of the few, if not only, places where Paul reveals his knowledge of the Jesus tradition, which then became the Synoptic Gospel. So what do we have in verses 23 to 25? For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Or to take a slightly expand it. For as for me, I received a tradition from the Lord, which I have handed on to you. Namely, that the Lord Jesus, in the night on which he was handed over, took bread and gave thanks. He broke the loaf and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, with reference to the cup after supper, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Now, intensive controversy over the phrase, this is my body, <laughs> which, as I learned from Barton in Aramaic, would not have had a verb in language. It has divided the church over the centuries. I am not going to spend any time on the doctrine of transcendence. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Thistleton, I felt, made a very good statement about this. This is what he said. It lies beyond both Jesus' intent and the framework within which he and the disciples lived. To imagine that some actual change took place or was intended to take place in the bread itself. Now, you have your other hand out because it is, of course, fascinating and revealing to compare this account in 1 Corinthians, which is our oldest account, with what we have in the three synoptic gospels in order of composition, Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Mark. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Hey, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Matthew, who is perhaps 10 years after Paul, uh, Mark, says, while they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Luke, and years after that, then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. <clears throat> Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Now, you can be scholars. What do you have to say about the four? We have four versions now. <laughs> What 
what can we say about the synoptics as compared to what we have in First Corinthians? Well, for example, what does Mark not have that Paul had? No remembrance of me. Yes, that's it. Exactly. No remembrance of me. That is not in Paul. It is not in Matthew either. So this is a, a notable difference. Um, what else did you see? Company. Yes, exactly. Um, and your NRSV may tell you that there should, but there should. I mean, in other words, the synoptic simply have pop, pop, covenant, and it's Paul um, and um, and uh, and we can have um, um, what else? They, an interesting. They, it says after supper, where it's these three say while we were eating. Yes. So uh, like that's I, my difference. You know, whether that is, is significant. There's a lot of debate about what the last supper was relative to the Passover. And so um, but we can only go by these texts that we have. Um what you have in Paul is <laughs> Well, look at this is my body. Okay. What is added to that? Or is there nothing added to that? That's for you. Yes. In other words, Paul said, which is for you. And as we have it in Luke, which is given for you. But neither of the other two, they simply had it there. That's it, which is my body. Okay. Um, and besides the business of the covenant, what about the blood? New covenant in my blood. Yes, that's what Paul says. <laughs> what does Mark say? This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Okay, so you give an added phrase to define the blood. And Matthew goes even farther. For forgiveness of poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. So uh, it, I find it very interesting that even though Paul is early, <laughs> Luke is latest of the synoptics, they appear closer together than Paul does to either Mark or Matthew or Mark or Matthew to Paul. Um, so that led me to speculate. First uh, Corinthians, we know, uh, was a well-known document in the early church. It's quoted and praised by other early authors. So could it be possible that Luke actually had seen or heard part of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians and that he was responding to what he had read there um, worth thinking about, I think. Um, the uh, business about in remembrance of me, of course, Paul again differs even from Luke as he has it twice for both the bread and the cup. And I think this is because it's very important for these Corinthians to remember. Uh, what is important um, that that this is not just ordinary bread and wine it's given by Christ is and when they're doing it they need to be thinking about Christ's last supper and Christ's death on the cross um, as somebody put it remembering is not to re failure to remember is not absent-mindedness it's unfaithfulness to the covenant and I was struck by that statement in the New Testament. Remember the poor. It doesn't mean just think about them. It means do something about it. Okay. There's another issue that you may have seen in the in the difference. If you remember your your narratives of, of the Last Supper, 
In the Synoptic Gospels, at the supper, Jesus tells the disciples, one of you will hand me over. Both Matthew and Mark have this, that is to say, Judas, right? Some scholars, however, believe that in Paul, handed over does not mean handed over by a treacherous disciple, but handed over by God. And the, the evidence for this is two passages. One is the Septuagint translation of Isaiah 53, 6, and the Lord gave him up for our sins. This is the the of the sufferer. And also Paul himself in Romans 8, 32, he who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us. At the time Paul wrote this letter, of course, these words of institution were not necessarily a liturgical recital that everybody had been using for a long time. What he does is to give a description of what Jesus did at that meal, rather than a legislative account of what the church ought to do. And then we turn to the very significant verse 26. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. For as many times as you eat this bread and drink the cup, it is the death of the Lord that you are proclaiming until he comes. So Paul's theology of the cross is very clear here, and his allusion to the context of Jesus' words makes his point powerfully. For Paul, the Last Supper corresponds to the Passover of Judaism. Jesus provided at a Passover meal, but a Passover meal which proclaimed his own broken body and shed blood as the new Passover for Christian believers. That for you, in verse 24, makes the Christian participants in the Lord's Supper present with Jesus in the upper room. Like the Jews at their Seder, the members of the Christian congregation become contemporary with the fundamental act of salvation at the Lord's Supper. That phrase, until he comes, of course, is referring to the fact that the Christian story has not ended yet. There is the end time which is coming. The Lord's Supper then is a preliminary to what is called the Supper of the Lamb, the final consummation in which to which the Lord's Supper points as, as a promise. The Christian story has begun, but not yet reached its culmination. And you see, this is particularly important for him to tell those Corinthians who keep acting as if they've already got it all. The millennium has come, the kingdom is already here, and they can do whatever they want. So he needs to explain to them, no, you're still travelers en route, you haven't gotten there yet, and you're still going to make mistakes, and uh, you're still vulnerable. So, verse 27, a prophet. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Or, consequently, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in a way that is not fitting will be held accountable for so treating the body and blood of the Lord. Paul's point is that attitude and conduct should fit the message and solemnity of what is proclaimed. At Corinth, however, they were inappropriate and unsuitable. More difficult, of course, is that phrase, answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. One must be held accountable for the sin against Christ, claiming identification with him while using the celebration of the meal as an occasion for social enjoyment or status enhancement without regard to what sharing the Lord's Supper proclaims. Yes, that's why I'm having time. 28 to 29, examine yourself 
And only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink judgment against themselves. Or as this expanded, <laughs> on the contrary, a person should examine his or her own genuineness, and only in this way eat from the loaf and drink from the cup. For all who eat and drink, eat and drink judgment on themselves if they do not recognize what characterizes the body as different. This is one of those passages that illustrates the problems of the English language. Greek uses only the third person singular here, which NRSD has felt the need to make plural, examine yourselves, because we don't have a word for human being which is not gender specific. Greek has anthropos, Latin has homo, we don't have it. So we don't want to say man anymore. So how do you get around that? And I think that this is an expansion is, is more helpful. Each person, in other words, as I put it, Paul emphasizes this, and we need to think of ourselves, our own behavior, each one of us. We can't hide in that all. Okay. So each of us must confirm, we understand, we have the attitude and conduct that are genuine about when we participate in the Lord's Supper. This phrase, without discerning the body, is a very difficult phrase. NRSV is a pretty much literal translation, but what in the world does it mean? Much has been written about these four Greek words, and I found it quite interesting my commentator is obviously an Anglican. He's a, a professor at a university in England, but he quotes Luther amazingly frequently. Mm -hmm. And at this particular passage, he quotes Luther, saying, God is not to be found except in sufferings and the cross. So as Paul teaches these status-minded <laughs> Corinthians about the Lord's Supper, he's concerned to emphasize participation in identification with the crucified Christ. Only this will generate the social transformation that this community needs. So they'll stop being so stratified between rich, high-class people and poor people who don't have much. They've got to get rid of the theology of glory and it's called for embracing the theology of the cross. Just a few more verses, 30, strange. For this reason, many of you are ill and some have died. It is for this reason that many among you are suffering weakness and ill health, and a good number have died. Some interpreters believe Paul's just speaking metaphorically, you know, they're spiritually dead or something. On the other hand, others think Paul believes that something real happens to the body of the Christian through participating in the Lord's Supper. So he just states facts that's happened. 31 to 32, for if we judged ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Or again, an expansion. If we recognize what characterizes us as Christian believers, we should not fall under judgment. But if we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we do not become condemned along with the world. As you see, the NRSV, like the Greek, repeats the verb judge. But I think that Thistleton's expansion does bring out the implications of Paul's rather cryptic sentence. What we must recognize is our status and obligations as Christian believers. Our distinctiveness is not as individual, but as, and he writes this as one word, the having died and being raised one body of Christ. <laughs> All right, what does discipline mean? Educated, being a disciple. It shouldn't give rise to doubt about your salvation or just be endured with resignation. 
being disciplined by the Lord has a positive role in helping us to conform to the image of Christ in suffering as well as glory. And at the end, as I said, he's going to go back and come together. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together, you wait for one another. If you are hungry, eat at home. So that when you come together, it will not be for your condemnation. About the other things, and this is only verse 11, this chapter letter has 16 chapters. Uh, about other things, I will get instructions when I talk. So then, dear fellow Christians, when you gather together for the meal, wait for one another. And if you are hungry, let that person eat at home. So that when you gather <clears throat> together, it will not be to fall under judgment with regard to the remaining matters. I'll suffer in more time. Huh. If the well to do take their more elaborate meals in their own private houses, the poor and disadvantaged will not be ashamed. As they are now, the way the Christian practice. Then, when all they meet together, they can focus their entire attention on the purpose of the Lord's subject to proclaim the Lord's death and their personal and corporate involvement in its redemptive and relational consequences as one body, the body of Christ. What I think, I've, I've spent hours and hours and hours on this passage, um, and it's really caused me to think about how to live a Christian life. Um, we often, I find myself saying, oh, why the hell don't you do that? Or, you know, why do I have to do anything? Well, you know, that's, that's Christ. You suffer for others, and you just have to stop bitching about it. <laughs> So I feel as if, for me, after all this that I have uh, studied about these passages, I think I'm I'm going to go to communion to take the body and blood with with a greater understanding of uh, what what the theology of the cross is really all about, and what uh, the fact that we should be thinking that we're we're back in the upper room at the, at the, at the Last Supper itself. And that's not always easy, considering all the years that have passed. But I think that's that's what we can try to do. So anyway, end of story. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Are you taking, yeah, I was going to say, are you taking any questions or it's very thorough, very provocative. Especially Matthew um, is, is has a particular, just like Paul in this letter, who has a particular audience. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that um, the, the uh, synoptic writers did also. Well, and, and also, when you realize a lot of it's about how to prepare yourself and how to think and whatnot, and to be makes me understand a little bit we don't deal with it so much in our church the, the catholic church being prepared for that you have to have a certain frame of mind you have to be prepared yet before you take communion i mean you can see where that well, but see what i am which i'm like that i'm i'm not afraid to lose it in your other physical church and one of the things that struck me from the beginning and i feel speaks to that is the fact that we have the confession the very first thing we're going to start there clear the desk <laughs> you should go on. Sorry. Yeah. Um, thinking of this, especially at the start, in contrast to modern policies on diversity, equity, and inclusion, does this have anything special to speak to that? 
I think so because it's we may like to think that, and I think in some ways ancient societies were more they were stratified and everybody just accepted that. You know, you have free people, you have free people, you have slaves, you have, you know, all these things. Right. We don't technically <laughs> use that kind of language, but we still have divisions and they're often based on economics, are they not? Yes, they are. Who, who can live in what neighborhood and you know, go to which school and all that. And so it, I mean, the, 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 the world that, that Jesus wanted us to help create, we haven't gotten there yet, it's just like that. we're in process. I mean, in some ways, I think we've made some steps in the right direction, haven't we? But uh, yeah, Paul. You were pointing out the places in which Paul is referring back to specifically Jewish texts and practices. Yeah. To what extent were the members of the Corinthian congregation Jews as opposed to Gentiles? I think, I mean, it's hard for us to know for sure, but I think the assumption is they would mostly be Gentile. There could well have been a small yeah. diaspora community in Corinth. It's, it's a, a seaport type city which would attract people of, of trading nature. Um, but I think the majority surely were, um, were Gentiles. And I think that's part of the problem because they do have these uh, ingrained feelings that what rich people can do and they haven't gotten the message, which is what Paul saying. I tried to tell you, but you didn't get it. No. Uh, Christian, uh, Christine, make the point you made in Bible study, which is the people of Corinth were not only violating the Jewish law, but they were sometimes violating the Roman law. Is yeah. that the point you were making? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so these guys are really off the reservation. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> they're, they're all, they're all <laughs> about having <laughs> Oh, was, was there was someone in the congregation who was who was sleeping with his stepmother and they were just not bothered by it at all. <laughs> Even the Romans they say this is illegal, you know, what's the matter with you guys? But it's because they somehow over emphasize this notion that having become Christians, well now we got it made, you know, we're we're, we're it. We can we're all set. You have yeah. money. Hey. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What was Paul's rhetorical purpose in casting back to all these Jewish traditions if he was addressing it primarily Gentile? Would he trying to get them to study up and understand where, Jew, where Jesus was coming from? Or was he trying to sort of recreate the way it used to be so that they can see where they're going. I think he probably can't expect them to you know, <clears throat> become experts on Torah, but I think that what he's we have to remember that he is a, what a Pharisee. I mean he's trained in Judaism and he doesn't feel this great division. He feels that that Christ is the culmination of the Jewish faith and the revelation that was given to Moses, so on and so forth. So that for, as I, as I was trying to say, when he quotes Moses, he feels that what Moses says to ancient Israelites, that's just as relevant to these Corinthians. They are now part of this new covenant, which is not just the Lord and the Israelites, but through Christ, the Lord and, and the world. And so they need to keep understand what that covenant is. And there's lots of things there that they that are contrary to what they have been able to live as happy little pagans. <laughs> Lead them to the history of their faith. Yeah, yeah. And that they can't cast that out, as we all know. We we would not exist without the Hebrew Bible. So you were saying, I, I just want to make two comments. Yeah. One, and I hope this is helpful. One is we think about the, the Hebrew scriptures as if there's, a, from the point of view of a division now, 
between the Christian church and Judaism. When this letter was written, um, there was no Christian church as separate church body. It was, as if you will, a sect within Judaism. So Paul is saying, if you're going to be, if you're going to be a sect within Judaism, the people who follow Christ, you got to know what Judaism is. That's one. But the second thing is, I hope, that you could, and you open this up. That's what I'm going to say. It. You know, when you go to communion today, um, or next time, whenever you go to communion, um, if you think like a Jew, and then at Passover, remember at Passover, the, the the youngest child asks one question: Why is this night? Not why was this night? Remembering. Remembering is not a matter of thinking so much as a matter of you are transported, literally transported to the upper room. You are there, and you're also at the first Passover. So if you, when you go to communion today, don't think about it as this is, uh, I'm reenacting something. No, you are there. And that puts the cross directly in the center of everything. Sorry, I had to do that. Oh, that was perfect. As to your first point, that this congregation is a Jewish sect, it seems like Paul also spilled an awful lot of ink on being being uh, circumcised, and that's kind of the mark of a Jew. You know, when he says you don't have to be circumcised, then it seems that he is saying this doesn't have to be a literally Jewish congregation. So you are correct. Yeah. So again, context is important. Yeah, and, and so I think you can eat shrimp, you know. Right. <laughs> well, so the, 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 the context for each of those is for our, in, in Galatians where he says that. Um, they are really fighting over it. In order to be a part of the Jewish sect, you must do all the Jewish things. Oh. And Paul says, no, you have to, and this is, again, it's exactly what you said. You need to send you, center yourself on the cross of Christ. Whether, if you're a Jew and you're forcing a non-Jew to become, uh, be, be circumcised, which is going to be a difficult problem, <laughs> then you you're, you're misunderstanding what it means to be a sect. In, what, what's different about us is that we're taking everybody in and asking them to center on the cross, not on the physical acts to them, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Galatians is a whole different book. Yeah. Yeah. It's earlier than... than... Yeah. You, don't, you don't know how much of the tradition we have in the Gospels about Jesus that Paul Yeah. And, but when you think of Jesus and his attitude to all the little laws of Judaism and so on, you know, it's, it's, it's radical. Yeah. And, um, yeah. But uh, another thing I would say, I guess this will come out in, in Lama study, but the, the ancient philosophies that Paul congregation were in contact with were very individualistic. You wanted to get your own happy life. Which might mean, you know, and for the Stoics, you know, not uh, being being uh, putting us in the lock, but just very much centered on the individual. And that's where I think this Christian emphasis on the community is so. He has to keep hammering on it because it's really sort of as odd for them as it is for us American individualists that we are. Um, these people were used to. Thinking, well, I'm, I make my own life, this sort of thing. And so being, being part of this communal participation, which is both, I mean, it is an amazing thing. A bunch of different individuals who are, I mean, look at all of us, how different we all are. And yet, we're one body. You use communal, but think of it tribally. Oh. Jewish, Jews uh, tribally. And I used to be on an Orthodox carpool for three oh. years, many of you know. <laughs> and they had no problems with me being Christian. They had problems with Reformed Jews. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and remember the time not following the tribal rules. 
I'm not a member of the tribe. I'm an individual. So you have to pray. Okay. So, so, yeah, so thank you all. It's a great session, Christine. Thank you. I think we will all approach community. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's more than coincidental that our yes, this, the month is going to interface. Oh, yes. Intermit yeah, Meals on Wheels. Yes, Bridget. Thanks, everyone.